right, good evening, everyone. So welcome to our PVOSD board meeting. We have translation available in Spanish. So if you need that support, please see um, Rania Lopez. And so tenemos traducido en español. Si necesita de este servicio, por favor, pase con Rania Lopez. And if someone would like to speak to an item um, on the agenda, you must complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria prior to the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes. And I just want to note that um, Trustee Flores communicated that she'll be absent this evening. And um, Trustee Soto will be joining us via Zoom. So I will ask Trustee Scow to, uh, to lead us in the pledge. All right. Please salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So we'll move on to our interim superintendent comments. Uh, Murray Sheckman, our interim superintendent, will make a few comments. Thank you, President Holm. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Democracy in Action, a la Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I have uh, a few thoughts I want to make sure the world knows, and I know we're on TV. Our superintendent search is starting. We actually have activities coming up at Watsonville High on November 7th. These are opportunities for groups to participate in forums and give input to leadership and associates, the group that we've hired, to help us uh, find the next superintendent. And this will all be published. Alicia gets it out in the community quite a bit. So at Watsonville High on November 7th at 6.30, at Aptos, most likely Aptos High, although it says to be determined, November 8th at 5.30. We're going to do a virtual one on Wednesday, November 8th at 6 p.m. And then Pajaro Valley High will be on Thursday at November 9th at 6 p.m. I also want to announce our uh, wonderful trustee student rep, Ruby, is not here tonight. She apparently is in the process, and I believe she was selected for a QuestBridge scholarship. And QuestBridge is like Millennium. It's basically she gets paid, she gets tuition paid for up to $200,000. Most colleges participate with this. Um, she's a super trustee, she's a super young lady, a senior at PV. And yeah, thank you, sir. Our Giants fans know when to clap. So congratulations, Ruby, maybe you're watching this. I'll be in her classroom doing a little lesson on Robert's Rules of Order and Leadership. And speaking of leadership, um, it's a sad moment for me and a sad moment for anybody who's had the privilege of working with Clint Rucker. Clint is our CBO, and this, to the, my, the best of my knowledge, is his last board meeting as our chief business officer. So I wanted to present Clint with the colors that match his eyes and the seasons. <laughs> So we'll move on to our governing board comments. Um, this is our opportunity for each board member to make a few comments, and we'll start with Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed the last meeting. I had a death in my family. Um, I did attend a school board association meeting last night, and um, present there um, was a legislative analyst from um, CSBA, and so he gave us a legislative update. Um, I, I don't think any of the trustees here made it to the roadshow. 
that CSBA did. They came to town recently, um, but we thank them for doing that. And I um, appreciate everyone being here. Thank you. Trustee Scout. Yes, good evening, everybody. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, just I wanted to congratulate art staff uh, for a successful parent teacher conference at EA Hall the previous Saturday. It was a great turnout. I know a lot of people here worked on that. So thank you for everybody uh, for making that successful. I want to uh, thank our music teachers uh, for bringing their kids to the state of the district. I wasn't able to be there. Uh, but I know that Ms. McPolland at McQuitty and Mr. Alanis at PV High are doing a fantastic job building a strong music culture uh, at those schools. So thank you. And uh, I heard that was a successful event as well. So thank you very much. Vice President Acosta. Yes, thank you. Um, so the only committee meeting I had that I was able to attend was agenda setting committee. Um, unfortunately, with the intergovernmental relations committee, um, it's I don't really know what's going on with that. We certainly need to get that um, hopefully buttoned down. It's, We've had meetings scheduled and then canceled and then rescheduled, and so hopefully we could get that back on track to be at their regularly scheduled times. I was not able to attend that one, unfortunately. Um, but I did want to ask again, um, Superintendent Sheckman, on those dates, could you just repeat that? You said um, no, the November 7th at Aptos at what time and November 8th virtual at what time? At Watsonville High at 6.30 p.m. Uh -huh. We don't know the room numbers yet. Okay. Aptos, November 8th at 5.30 p.m. Virtual, Wednesday, November 8th, 6 p.m. And then PV High School, Thursday, November 9th at 6 p.m. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right, and I would like to start my comments with acknowledging with gratitude um, the donation by the Valencia Home and School Club for the purchase of an AED. Um, so as a healthcare professional, you know, automatic external defibrillators are really important for um, early rescues uh, when people have a cardiac event. So I also attended agenda setting committee and the SELPA uh, CAC the Community Advisory Committee and great presentation from uh, Maria um, Feri Feria? Feria? Um, I'm just, sorry, my mind was having a moment. Like, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, the new principal at Duncan Holbert about our uh, speech and OT uh, services. And I particularly appreciated the work um, on finding a balance between supporting our special needs students and you know, supporting their independence. I also want to express my uh, personal appreciation for our outgoing CBO. Um, you have held the role with dignity, integrity, and kindness. And that's a trifecta of um, intense professionalism under trying circumstances. And it's been an honor and a joy to work with you, so thank you. All right, so we'll move on to item 3.5, our high school student board. Yes, we have one trustee remotely. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Trustee Soto, did you have any comments? He's telling me his sound is difficult, but he's there. Okay. So probably text me as a response. Okay. We can come back. Um, in the meantime, we'll move on to item 3.5, our high school student uh, board representatives, and we'll start with Aptos High School. Hi, my name is Ryan Ortiz, and I'm the new activities director at Aptos High School. I'm very excited to be making waves weekly announcements, which is a weekly video podcast created by students and some select staff that discusses events going on around campus, all the news that students are making waves weekly announcement, which is a weekly video podcast created by students and some select staff that discusses events going on around campus, all the news that students need to know to be successful, fun activities, and ways to get involved with our students. Hi, 
I'm Gamble Kellemeyer. And I'm Olivia Lobato. And I'm Taj Ray. And, and this is our Making Waves Weekly Week Announcements. Today, September 21st, is right in the middle of High School Voter Education Week. Civic engagement is important to ensure students learn how to become active and engaged participants in our democracy. If you are 16 or 17 years old, you are eligible to pre-register to vote. Visit the link down below to pre-register to vote. Your voice is important and you have the power to help steer the direction of our government. Lastly, homecoming dance is on Saturday, September 30th from 7 to 10 p.m. This will be a semi-formal dance and ASC students will be transforming the Warm and End Gym into an enchanting garden. And now for Mariner shoutouts. Ms. Natari is shouting out three students this week. First, she would like to shout out Rafael Hutardo Rodriguez for always having a positive attitude. He recently helped a new student feel at home. I can count on Rafael every day. <laughs> Fall's upon us and it's feeling pretty cozy around here. We asked a few Mariners what their favorite fall drinks were. Let's see what they said. Who am I here with today? Uh, Charlotte. Yeah, cool. And Charlotte, what's That's your favorite cool. fall drink? Uh, and I and Chai Lux. Yeah, Charlotte. Yeah. Who am I here with today? Charlie. And Charlie, what is your favorite fall drink? Oh, uh, do a Chai like Latte. Delicious. In case you missed it, here are some of the winners from our homecoming week. The homecoming parade winners are the seniors for their coronation, costumes, pirate ship golf cart, and decorations. The homecoming skit winner goes to the juniors. They had incredible outfits, music, a powerful message with a story to tell. The homecoming senior crown royalty winners are Cruz Torres and Layla Martinez. And here's some footage of our memorable week with more to come in the future. championship tournament. The first game's at 9 o'clock and it goes and the final is at 12.30. The first 25 people to arrive get free donuts, so come on down and support your Mariners. That's it Mariners, thanks for watching. See you next week. Make sure to subscribe. Do we have uh, any students from Renaissance High? Go ahead. Um, this is Renaissance High School Student Leadership Fall Quarter Second Update. Okay. 
These are our students of the month, Axeli Hernandez and Cesar Figueroa. These are our academics, field trips to Calabasas Elementary, Collaboration Life Lab, built raised planter beds, and we also got 50 new students for quarter two. This is our garden update. We have fences for the deers. This is our extended learning opportunity program. We have pizza and paint every Wednesday of the 23rd and 24th. CrossFit Watsonville every Tuesday and Thursday. Enjoyable for the teachers and the students to get along. We also have volleyball. Our junk furniture was removed from room 15 and we got to put the cars in the garage. Thank you to our maintenance and operations. This was our spirit week. These are our graduates. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. No, I, I can I can say from first hand knowledge that that garden is looking great. So awesome. All right. Do we have a virtual academy here? No. Okay. All right, then we will go ahead and go on to um, item 4.1. And can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I make a motion to approve the agenda. Uh, a second. A first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, hearing none, then I will, the motion carries 502. Um, Item 5.1, approval of the October 11th, 2023 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? A second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, 502. We don't have any public hearings, so we'll move on to item 7.1. So this is our opportunity for our members of the public to address um, items on our agenda or items that are not on our agenda for the evening. So just please know that the, the Brown Act uh, prohibits the board from engaging in discussion about items that are brought up under this item that we are listening. So do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. And I will call you up by three and if you could come up in that order and, um, if, and if I mispronounce your name, please do feel free to correct me and each speaker um, will have two minutes. Anna Brinkman, Elizabeth Maya, and Kathleen Gutierrez. Good evening, Board of Trustees. We are the HR analysts, specialists, and technicians of human resources. As you may recall, on October 11th, you received a presentation regarding the district office lobby update. We would like to express our concern about an additional new task that has been given to us by our assistant superintendent, Ellison Nizawa, and our directors, Pam Shanks and Brian Saxton. We were summoned to a quick staff meeting on October 12th, where we were told that we would be the backup for Peggy Raymond, the district rep receptionist in the main lobby and to cover her breaks and <clears throat> lunches. Allison also stated that Peggy will become part of the HR department. She has not technically moved to HR, nor does the district receptionist report to HR. The pos position reports to purchasing. HR administrators are working with purchasing to create a new job description for some of Peggy's duties in purchasing. 
why not have Peggy stay in the position in purchasing and create, create a new job description for the district receptionist for the lobby specific for that desk? The new position in purchasing can be designated back up to the lobby. For background history, Ida Alvarez, HR technician, retired on September 1st, 2022. We were told that her job would be eliminated. Once the lobby was complete, the HR front, front door would be locked and anyone from the public would filter through the lobby. We continued our temporary front desk duties in HR until August 8th, 2023, when the lobby was completed. We have taken on additional tasks with the elimination of the HR technician. This has impacted our own desk duties. We cannot continue to do our work accurately if we are constantly being pulled to do additional tasks which fall outside the HR department. We have no problem helping. We ask that the responsibility be shared equally amongst all departments. That was too nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. Um, my name is Elizabeth and I'm an HR analyst uh, uh, for the uh, PDSD HR department. Um, and I'm here to share that today we received an update from our assistant superintendent, Allison Isawa, that she had met with administrators here at the district office to discuss coverage when our district receptionist um, is out on vacation or sick leave, um, yet the HR staff is still um, covering breaks and lunches. As my colleague shared, um, we have no problem helping with coverage, but we ask that a different solution um, is thought of for this problem as, you know, this is pulling us from our, from our daily tasks. Thank you. Good evening, board trustees and interim superintendent Sheckman. I'm Dr. Kathleen Gutierrez and I'm an assistant professor in history at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Tonight I'm joined by Malaya Simon Reynolds, a doctoral candidate at UCSC and we're representing Watsonville is in the Heart, a community driven research initiative of faculty, students and over 40 community members dedicated to preserving Filipino American history in the Pajaro Valley. We've come to express our concerns regarding what we see as the insufficient deliberation of PVUSD's contract with Community Re Res Response of Education last September. In 2021, Watson Villas in the Heart started working with teachers and students in PVUSD to craft high school level lesson plans, digital tools, and field trips on local Filipino American history that align with ethnic studies requirements. We identified PVUSD as an incredible partner district because of the very histories which we are pre preserving and now disseminating which come from the district's very own graduates. These graduates have shared meaningful narratives we see as critical to current students' effective grasp of local ethnic studies. Our approach is inspired by the pedagogical tenets of com community responsive education, which CRE is an expert in. In the last several weeks, we've been disturbed to learn of the haste, unsubstantiated manner with which the board voted to deny CRE's contract renewal. As researchers and advocates for excellent education, we engage in multiple levels of review just to create lesson plans for your classrooms. The review process is rigorous, time intensive, and deeply research based. And I would expect the same level of commitment on the part of the district's leadership. Until members of the community assure us that CRE's contract and its full approach and materials are thoroughly reviewed, Watson Villas in the Heart must suspend its work with the district. To date, we have dedicated $60,879 in direct and personnel costs with pending additional funds in the sum of 4580 we earmarked for PVUSD. To uphold our own research integrity and that of the district with which we partner, we hope you provide evidence of a sustained, detail reviewed of the contract. Thank you. Our next three, uh, Martha Flores, Mike Floor, and Bobby Pels. Thank you, Marta Flores. Um, I'm a member of the community. I also work at EA Hall, and I have family members in all the schools in the school district. Family mm -hmm. reunions, that's where I find out what's going on in the schools. But a month ago, we had a family reunion. I'm talking to my young relatives and asking them how school is going. And the kids who are in ELL classes, newcomers, tell me, Oh, the teacher's learning Spanish faster than we are learning English. And I'm listening. 
yeah, but our classes got reduced, but now we get other classes coming in, and now we have one or two more classes in our English classes. So we're just sitting there and not really learning. And I'm concerned about this, and I hope the board members can address it, because I purposely went to the parent conference because it was a workshop that was going to address EL uh, classes, and I asked the question, and other parents actually asked for before me. They asked, how do you monitor that our children are learning English? How do you monitor the teachers? And the question was never answered. I was directed to other people. I searched for those people, and I wasn't given an answer. I hope the board then will answer that question, please. How do you monitor that our kids are in the appropriate classes and not being clutter in with other classes and they're not learning English because they're having to, the teachers having to watch more than one class. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the invitation for Mi Casa Tu Casa that EA Hall is participating again this year. Thank you. Good evening board and uh, board of trustees and President Holm and interim superintendent Sheckman. My name is Mike Floor. I'm here to talk about the supplemental pay rate decrease for non-PVFT employees. Me and my comrade here have been working in the district for almost 20 years. We put in full-time weeks. We've done every other position there is, and we are LPAC testers. He's been LPAC testing for 22 years, and we've been making a hourly rate for the last three years. That's, uh, I'm not going to get into the specific number, but with the new adjusted supplemental rate for non-PVFT teachers, that means a $2.63 and like 63 cent cut in pay for both of us. I brought this up a co last couple, uh, two meetings ago, and um, I don't think that's right. Nobody would like a pay reduction. I'm not asking to be brought up to the rate that the PVFT um, teachers and retired teachers are making. Just don't reduce our pay, keep it what it's been. That's my point, that's the reason I'm here tonight. And um, I think he would agree with me. Can he talk yes. during this? Yeah, definitely. It's just me. It's, it's, it's for you. Up. Okay, he's here to support. Here to support. We yeah. feel the same way. We're just asking that you keep our rate the same. Don't reduce it. That's ridiculous. Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, board. Uh, my name is Bobby Pels, and um, I'm a teacher at Watsonville High School. I teach ethnic studies. And uh, I want to speak uh, again on the, the CRE contract. Uh, I've already spoken on this topic a few times, but I'm not going to let this go. Um, I think that an injustice has been done here. Uh, I understand your fears of anti-Semitism, and I support your efforts to stamp out oppression wherever you find it. Uh, that's an essential tenet of ethnic studies. But sometimes in our desire to do the right thing, we go too far. Uh, I believe in this case, you overstepped. I think you have not only deprived our ethnic studies program of the support that it needs to continue being the great program that it is, but you have also slandered the good name of someone who didn't deserve it. That's not right. In the same way that you don't want our district to be associated with anti-Semitism, <clears throat> I don't want our district to be associated with defaming good people. CRE is a great program. It has done and it will do a lot of good for our ethnic studies program. Alison Tintiago Cabales is one of the good ones. And she's exactly the kind of person that we would want to support our district and our program. So let's write this wrong. Let's put the contract back on the agenda. Let's vote to approve. And let's issue a formal apolog apology for Alison Tintiago Cabales. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Sarah Webb, Sue Rodriguez, and Christine Hong. Good evening, board and interim uh, superintendent Sheckman. My name is Sarah Webb. I'm an ethnic studies teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, I really count on community responsive education for coaching and leadership. I worked um, individually with Allison Titiango Cabales the last couple years to develop a framework specifically for my course. I find it really useful and really good with, for the students. And I also would like to ask for you to renew the contract with CRE and 
get them back on board because I really count on them. Also, I find that Allison is a very honorable and really very highly qualified person. And I feel very lucky, like she's like a superstar that like I'm so lucky I get to learn from her. Um, so I also would humbly suggest that maybe some people could apologize to her. Um, thanks very much. Good evening, board members, trustees, and interim superintendent, Mr. Sheckman. My name is Sue Rodriguez, and I proudly work at Watsonville High School. I've been with the district for 10 years. I'm speaking on behalf of all classified staff at Watsonville High. I know negotiations have started regarding pay increases for next year. I've heard that you're offering a 5% raise, and simply that is not enough. I want to bring attention to some of the data I have found. In 2018-2019, we got a 1% raise. In 1920, a 1%. In 2021, oh, I mean, excuse me, 1819 to 3%, 1920 a 1, 2021 a 1%, 2122 a 4.5, and last year was a 10%. We are the lowest paid district under surrounding areas. Some other data found, which I have a copy for you, to afford renting a two bedroom apartment in Santa Cruz and Wattsville era, you have to make $63.33. None of us are making that. Cost of living costs have risen tremendously, especially food and gas costs. I want to point out that Watsonville High is the largest enrollment compared to other two high schools. In a recent survey, we were voted number one in customer service. We also were the first high school to um, reach 99% in the income verification. We feel the di district overlooks Watsonville High School. We feel that we're not appreciated acknowledged for the hard work we do. We deal with students and parents daily and by the recent survey shows how extremely well we are doing. Many of us don't own their own homes, so we have to rent. Many want to buy but cannot. They're struggling to keep food on their table and pay essential bills. I urge you to consider at least a 10% raise because not only do we deserve it, but it'll make up for the early years when we got a measly 1%. We have a great leadership and our interim principal, Joe Gregorio. I support him 100%, along with vice principals, Mr. Reese, Ms. Lenore, Ms. Legaretta, and Ms. Samuels. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christine Hong. Um, I spoke here a couple of weeks ago. I am a professor in critical race and ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz. I served as the inaugural chair of that department. And I just want to reinforce um, what the nature of ethnic studies is. Ethnic studies is socially transformative. Um, in its first um, emergence in the Bay Area, it represented a democratizing strike against the system of public education to better serve communities of color and indigenous communities that had not been well served by the traditional curriculum. And right now, it's very concerning to me and to so many other people that you are not serving the students of your district. I think that as policy makers, people who make decisions about educational policy, you should model the very skills that you hope to equip your students with. And that includes critical thinking, and it's a very basic it's a very basic skill that when you present an argument, if you present an allegation, it must be backed by evidence. There was no evidence that was furnished in the unsubstantiated allegations that were made against CRE and its founder a month ago. Um, and I want to say that we here in California like to proclaim our difference from Florida in terms of our orientation to our students. This has been a majority minority state since 2000. But what happened here a month ago was profoundly undemocratic. You did not consult with your teachers. You didn't go into the classroom. You didn't make any effort to substantiate the claims that you made. So I really think this is a time to rethink the decision you made. I hope that you'll put it Thank back you. on the agenda. Our next three speakers are Chris Webb, Andy Salazar, and Angelina Hernandez. Uh, 
Uh, good evening. I wanted to share some reflections on the, the report last meeting about uh, test scores. And well, the first thing is just something that I've noticed at the site level and at the district level, and that's sometimes some people have a, a tendency to, I feel, overestimate the impact of COVID on students. And then I feel like that puts us at risk of um, lowering standards and then in turn creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts. I feel like we, you know, this might be a situation where we ought to survey the students, which is something teachers at, at the site level have done, and that's partly where this is coming from. Because I know what I've heard at the site level from students. I, I would encourage the district to consider doing the same kind of survey. Also, um, hearing the report, I am hopeful, actually, because there's a couple things that uh, stood out to me. I'm hoping we'll have a renewed emphasis on, on fact and data, um, because I, I feel like the data for the last couple of years, post-distance learning, there's been some data that would suggest that some of the changes that we've made haven't served the students. So I, I think we should really make sure we're looking at the data and then be, be courageous enough to make course corrections. Um, also, one of the things that was said was about uh, maximizing school classroom time, which I think is a great thing. Um, and thinking about that now, just today, I lost power in my room again, or the whole school lost it. But like, that's the kind of thing where, like, I, I've never, I asked the students, have you ever been to a school that's lost power this much? It was a beautiful sunny day. We keep losing power. If we want to maximize instructional time, like, we got to get the basics. Um, also, we should consider, we should consider going back to variable credits just because the culture that's created when you go to grades um, is, is not the best. And also, I think of, like, the 60% threshold, if I came and did six, showed up for 60% of the days, is that really going to meet the expectations of my job? At Renaissance, we prepare for college and career, historically. Thank you. So Andy Salazar is a, a Renaissance student who shared with me his comment. You did allow this like two meetings ago. His is very short. No. Chris, we can't do that. I'm sorry. We, 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 okay, we, I will let this. Uh, this is a matter of privilege because not everyone has the privilege to be here. He's working right now. He's working right down the street. I understand, but Chris, we, we need we really need to not allow that any further. All right. Our next public speaker is Angelina Hernandez and then uh, Sean Henry. Good evening, board. My name is Angie Hernandez, student body president from Renaissance. I'm here to talk about variable credits versus grades. Currently, we changed to grades, which is more difficult for kids to succeed. Variable credits has helped kids in many ways, such as them receiving credits for each assignment and coming. Now that we have grades, it affects students that don't come daily and also takes away the reason to go to a continuation school. We wish to return back to variable credits. Hello, my name is Sean Henry. I'm a school psychologist at Watsonville High School, but I'm currently on a sabbatical. We'll just call it that right now. Um, I wanted to um, commend um, all of our uh, student trustees, uh, the Watsonville High School one, getting that uh, prestigious uh, scholarship. Um, I love the, the Aptos High School um, spirit and having the three just involved, and I want to commend um, the Renaissance uh, trustee uh, for hanging in there with um, with uh, digital glitches which happen in life so as I told my interns last year uh, I always have paper backup but I know that kind of kills trees so Gen, Gen Z's doesn't is a Gen Z anyway not not always for that always for the paper but um, I just wanted to um, first address okay well that's off um, The last time I was up here, I kind of surprised people, and, um, and I just was going to give an update. Um, I wanted to thank the district um, for our excellent health care benefits and the, f the fortuitous of our union and our members to maintain quality health care as a standard, not just for our teachers, but for our community. Um, we, we have a rare 
a uh, bit of health care, um, and we should uh, continue to fight for that. I know that there's uh, priorities with money and everything like that, but um, uh, yesterday I had uh, the greatest uh, cancer news. Um, I have stage four cancer, but it was actually my wife. Uh, we had a um, her five-year checkup, and so she's cured. And so I want to thank everybody. to all our speakers. Um, we'll move on to our, our employee organizations. So now is the time that we hear from our employee organizations. Each will have five minutes. So we'll start with PVFT. Good evening, board. <clears throat> Excuse, I don't feel too great today. Um, all right, hello, I'm Nelly Vaquera Boggs, president of the PVFT. Uh, I want to start off with an appreciation to our school psychologists who work very dil diligently and, and hard to serve the community um, of students in our district and collaborate with um, the staff in our district. So thank you very much for the work that you do. <clears throat> We have been working with the dis I, oh, and I also want to say uh, thank you, Claudia Monjaras, for inviting um, Radhika and myself to a meeting to talk about um, just elementary education. And thank you, Lisa, for being present um, at that meeting. And we are incredibly hopeful. Uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, I, I had to kind of pinch myself afterwards. I'm like, okay, well, I <laughs> don't want to hold my breath because um, I'm afraid of that. <laughs> so why? Because we are still working some, through some major wrinkles. Um, I'm, again, still just, I'm exhausted. I'm actually fatigued at this point of the um, advocacy that of the same story that we bring to you every year. <clears throat> we are grateful that we've been invited, our executive board has made an appointment to meet with the organization that is helping search for the superintendent. And we're gonna have that opportunity to speak to what we would like for our future superintendent, um, some qualities for that, for that person to have. Um, and one of these things is to truly communicate with us. Um, and not be snarky about it. Be professional about it. Uh, one of the items that, one of the events that happened in this district last week, last week was state of the, state of the district. It's kind of a, an interesting thing that, that came in with Dr. Rodriguez and it happened this year. Um, and it may seem like, why do you care that you weren't notified? None of the unions, none of labor was invited. It, and that's really, it's just an extension of, of an acknowledgement of you are an important part of this district and together we make this district. This is what makes us unified, not just the students in the community that attend our schools. Um, and uh, I checked in with our, um, with CSEA and you know, we weren't invited. The response I got to that was incredibly insulting. It was insolent, as a, as a matter of fact. Um, and that doesn't bode well. There's something on this agenda tonight that typically has, what has happened is the labor um, units, we have been notified in advance of any time that there is a new safe return um, to in-person update. Because it's a required piece to maintain ESSER funds. And um, we have always been given a timely draft. Hey, CSEA and PBFT, here's a draft. Um, what do you think? Give us, here's where we've made some changes, some updates. Look it over. 
if there's anything that you might need to, if you catch anything, and I have caught something in the past, um, let me know before I present it to the board. So again, we have been shut out. You hear now teachers coming forward of the things that are happening across our district. These are things that impact our students. When you're not truly communicating with labor, you are also ignoring your students. You're ignoring your labor by abusing their their soul for their the, the just for being employed in this district. Because you're employed and you work in the district office, you should sit at that at that desk in the front. Because you're employed in this district and you're a teacher in this district, you should uh, take on the extra classes that, you know, because, we, yeah, we, we are short on subs. And, um, but then I'm only going to pay you the lower substitute rate that's in contract. Um, or another disservice, to, especially to our families with students with special needs, we're going to double up on the work that the teacher who is writing legally contracting documents to serve our students by impacting their caseload because we're going to try to get past your contract language. Thank you. This might seem trivial, but this is significant. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone from CSCA here this evening? Okay. Do we have anyone from Pavam? Good evening, President Home, Board of Trustees. Interim Superintendent Sheckman. I'm Jen Littleton Bruno. And on behalf of Pavam, I'm thrilled to share with you that tomorrow is National Lights On After School Day. We in PVUSD are celebrating 25 years of after school programming. Lights On After School is the national celebration of after school programming across our country. My understanding is 25 years ago, our department started with two staff and $20,000. As of today, we are at over 500 staff in over $42 million. The impact of expand and learning in PVOSD, yearly we are serving 5,500 students, TK through 12th grade. We offer 30 after school sites. We offer 90, 90, 90 additional days of nine hours of programming in weekend and inner sessions in summer school. That equals 730 additional hours of enrichment and learning time for our students. We offer breakfast club, after school program, midday TK, summer school, summer camps, inner session camps, PARO, passport, and credit recovery. And how are we gonna celebrate this? We're not gonna celebrate it, apparently. <laughs> oh no. Can you switch it for me? Okay, we are celebrating. We are doing color runs across our district over the next for day, over the next two weeks. Can you switch it one more time? Is it working? Oh, it worked now. Okay, so color runs will occur at 24 different school sites across four different days. Here is just a couple that are happening over the next two days, and I would like to invite all of you um, and all of our community and our teachers and our principals to come celebrate the work that these 500 staff are doing in keeping over 5,000 students safe in critical hours of the after school time period. A color run is really, really fun. You get a t-shirt and you run through chalk and it's thrown at you and it is messy and you will see students laughing and just having so much 
fun and a chance just to be a kid. So these are just a couple of the different opportunities. If these don't work for your schedule, I'm happy to give you other opportunities. We have them over the next two weeks. And to do a full celebration, we are, there's something called lighting up a monument. This is a national thing. And so what are we lighting up? On Saturday, we have registered 2,300 participants to come light up Gilroy Gardens with us. And we um, are so excited. El Sistema will be doing performances for our students. They will have free parking. There will be a buffet for our families. They get games. And our families get to go as a community and celebrate at no cost. And so we're super excited. And we still have a couple spaces if there's anyone who wants to come celebrate with our families. So we are thrilled to celebrate Lights On really big this year. And um, our partners at Gilroy Gardens are really excited. This is one of the largest they partnerships that they've had. So thank you for your time tonight, and I hope that I'll get to see you guys at our future events. Thank you. Do we have uh, anyone from CWA? Good evening again, Board of Trustees, uh, Mike Floor and David Romo. I'm just here to uh, thank you for um, the tentative agreement for this, the rate increase for substitutes. There's still work to be done, but we're grateful that we made some progress in the right direction. Um, so thank you very much. Um, at the next meeting, Louis Rocha is gonna be attending. He has some things he wants to talk to you about. That's the night that you're gonna ratify, hopefully, the new agreement. And we look forward to the two reopeners that we have coming the next couple of years. Um, so we can still make progress in the direction that we're already going. Um, so this is just a, a appreciation comment to you, just a progress update. We're putting together a local chapter. Um, Lewis was making work with the lodge that he used to have meetings in when he was the full-time president. And um, he will explain more in a couple weeks. So now... Yeah. And he might have something to add. Yeah, I'm just going to add some stuff here. I would like to excuse my presentation. Um, I just got back from Salinas. I took my son to ABA therapy. He receives it every Wednesday. So I have a busy day. On Wednesday is my busy day. And so I just finished unpacking my Costco stuff, and I'm here. Um, the last time I was here was 21 years ago when I talked. Um, I was the founder of SCAST, which was the South County Associated of Substitute Teachers. A group of colleagues came to me and asked me if I would be the leader, and I said, yeah, I would definitely want to be, lead you guys in and getting representation. And so I, I, we affiliated. We, we affiliated with the CWA. I went, after we went to, the, through Oak, to Oakland, and we, we did all the PERB -P -E stuff, we got ratified. We were, we were accepted by the state of California, and we, we decided to, um, how would you say it, invite the Communication Workers of America to represent us. And I'd like to actually uh, acknowledge the lack of communication throughout the years. I decided to have a family, raise kids, buy a house, make money, lose money, do all the normal stuff that people do in life. And I'm really appreciative of the steps that we've made. Obviously, we've seen that the teachers have made, you know, immense, you know, expansive process they're just growing and they're getting more and more s strength and so we're just following their lead we really want um to to be a presence again and uh we really want uh for for you guys to really truly care according to your 2001 model and the power of words are very powerful um if you if you you can't just just go and pick a model every year you have to keep on reliving those models every year over there, so you really get a chance to what you really get a chance to see when you don't care. Uh, I will acknowledge um, the fact that we weren't in good communication, um, but we really want you to care about substitute teachers. We are essential. We go into situations every day where we're being judged. Parents are judging us. They're asking us, they can, are they judging us? Are, 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 our, are our kids okay with you? We come in as strangers, and we have to prove ourselves every day when we come to school. It's not a joke. We have, you have to have 
like, immense confidence to be in front of people, to lead kids, and to one thing to guarantee their security. Uh, how would I say this? Um, when I go to school, when, when the kids see me, they are generally thankful to see me. I, I was in, a, in a, an environment one time where I got a standing ovation. That's the greatest. When everybody, you walk into the Ohlone School, everybody says, hey, Mr. Romo, how are you doing? They come in, they love me. Why? Because I love them. And that's a difference. So I suggest that you guys all get out and make some children friends. And I, I, I expect greatness from those kids. I don't expect anything less than greatness from them. And I know that they'll be great. But these are our products right here. These are the products. These are the kids right here. These are the kids ones for the future, the kids that were in this school education system. We need to make these guys great too. So I'd like to thank everybody for, for acknowledging the substitutes, for giving us a pay raise. We're, we're still not satisfied, just like you wouldn't be satisfied. You know, we have that thing that to go with, with that whole thing about the testing thing that has to be acknowledged. But anyways, uh, thank you for your time. And go home and love your loved ones. Thank you. All right. So we will move on to our action items and start with uh, item 9.1, our migrant and seasonal Head Start refunding application with proposed expansion for 2024-25. The report will be presented by Angelica Renteria, our Migrant and Seasonal Head Start Director. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Checkman. My name is Angelica Renteria, Director of the Migrant and Seasonal Head Start Program. And with me. Good evening, Tony Jordan with the Stanislaus County Office of Education, Executive Director, Cabinet Member of the Child and Family Services Division there. As we move into the new funding cycle, I'm happy to give you a brief program overview as part of the refunding application for 2024-2025. The annual application is due to the Office of Head Start, December 1. And we are here tonight to review the application components and to share some of the program data, challenges, priorities, and opportunities. In your packets, you can see most of the components of the refunding application, and that include budgets, program service plan, training and technical assistance plan, community assessment, and eligibility procedure. This is our planning calendar. If you remember, I presented this planning calendar at the board training back in March. It is an important instrument to guide our processes and make sure we don't miss important, important deadlines for funding. If you look at the calendar, we are now between the September and November activities. The only component missing from today's packet is the program goals and objectives, as we usually leave goals and objectives to the end of the cycle to ensure ne necessary adjustments or modifications are made before submission once all the program data has been collected, analyzed, and discussed. The goals and objectives are scheduled to be presented to the policy committee at the November 2nd meeting, and if approved, it will be added to the November 8th board meeting agenda under consent. A little bit of information about the program. PBUSD is a sub-recipient to Stanislaus County Office of Education. We are federally funded. We joined the program in 1988. Our current contract is for 640 children. Two of them, 286 seasonal, 354 migrant. We provide two program options, centers and family childcare homes offered services to families for 12 hours a day from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, in two different seasons, 115 days, May through October, and 115 days, August to February.
For those of you wondering what the difference is between the two groups, migrant and seasonal, I just want to give you a brief definition. A migrant family changed residence by moving from one geographical area to another for the purpose of engaging in agriculture. A seasonal family is engaged in agriculture but is not required to change residence looking for work. This slide shows the language of the families we serve and the most common migration patterns. Out of the 640 children, 52% are from Mexican indigenous families. As you can see, between 2006 and 2023, there has been an increase in the indigenous population arriving to Watsonville, 49%. In 1988, our families migrated from Michoacan. In 2023, our families migrate from Oaxaca or between Oxnard, Santa Maria, and Watsonville. This slide represents the ages of the children we serve, race and language as identified by, by the families themselves. And languages are broken down by language for additional detail. So the, the, the language families identified is 54% speak Spanish, 46% speak a Mexican indigenous language. Out of the 46%, 56 speak Mixteco Alto, 25% Mixteco Bajo, no, the opposite, 17% Zapoteco and 2% Purepeche from Michoacan. This year in 2023, 52% of our children are from indigenous background. So in 1988, when we joined uh, Stanislaus County Office of Education, our families worked in apples, canneries, strawberries, and we created the regular season, or the main season, May to October. And we selected May to October to cover the core of the main agriculture season agricultural season in Watsonville. To increase enrollment opportunities for low-income families, the definition of agriculture expanded beginning 2017, allowing programs to serve families in other months of the year. In our case, at PBUSD, following the local industries, we created a winter program to serve the needs of those families working in agriculture during the fall and winter months. So now with the definition of agriculture, opportunities have opened for more families in the community. And Tony Jordan has been an advocate for the expanded definition of migrant and agriculture. So would you like to add something to this conversation? Absolutely, just a few points. Uh, as the County Office of Education and Stanislaus, you might wonder what I'm doing here. Um, California, as you know, is a very vast, diverse, and large territory. In 1969, when the Migrant Seasonal Head Start program came to life, California was split into five regions. Unlike some states across uh, our great country were clumped together and served by one grantee, uh, here in California, the Migrant Seasonal Head Start program was divvied up amongst five grantees, Stanislaus County Office of Education being one of those, and we serve the central uh, part of California with uh, eight different counties. So um, I'm here to provide uh, any background information, respond to any questions the board might have, and show our support uh, of this consolidation. Not the first consolidation that Pajaro has been through for this specific program. If you've been around a while or know the area, you may recall the name Growth and Opportunity, Geo Kids, or Go Kids. Uh, that was another uh, consolidation effort that took place uh, some decades back. Um, we're proud of our partnership with Pajaro Valley Unified School District. We are a national center of excellence. We are an award-winning grant for Migrant Seasonal Head Start. And you may or may not know this, but we are proud because every time folks from across the country want to come and see a model family child care home service delivery utilizing Head Start funds, they come here to Watsonville and the surrounding Pajaro Valley area to see that in action. So 
Uh, we've continued to advocate for more seasonal slots. That's something that's come directly from your community assessment as well as the other counties where we uh, provide this grant. And we've been able to uh, expand the definition of agricultural work. Uh, over the years, we've done two of those uh, revised performance standards with the feds. And so again, thank you for your partnership and we completely support this consolidation that Santa Cruz County Office of Ed uh, brought to us and we helped uh, bring to you here tonight for your consideration. And since not everything is perfect, we have our challenges as every other program does. For the past five years, we have experienced declining enrollment, as you know, 26% in our district. We are also experiencing staffing teacher shortages, competition of family childcare homes with other agencies, as the governor allocated more state funding into early childhood education programs. Other programs are also contracting with family childcare home slots in the community. Also, the limitation of family childcare home uh, licenses for infants, and um, that leaves many, many babies in the waiting list for the duration of the season, including the eligibility status of families that also plays a role as our migrant slots are limited, and we end up having more seasonal families applying for services every year. High cost of living in the area does not allow for families anymore to live and return, as housing might not be available when they come back and increased personal costs, not only with salaries, but with health insurance and retirement. <clears throat> Priorities for 2024-2025, we continue collaborating with Cabrillo College and other educational institutions. We continue supporting the grantee uh, in advocating for the conversion of migrant slots to seasonal. We continue supporting school readiness and social emotional competence of children. And we are in the process of hiring a bilingual parent education specialist to support families who speak a Mexican indigenous language, seeing the large number of families that we have in the program. <coughs> and what are the opportunities that we currently have? Along with challenges, we also have the opportunities. In 2022, eligibility requirements were modified to include not only the low-income families as based on the federal uh, poverty guidelines, but those families, <coughs> excuse me, but those families receiving some type of public assistance, such as social security and food stamps. With this opportunity, uh, eligibility increased greatly for our local families. Recently, Head Start aligned eligibility for children under three for all Head Start programs allowing families to remain eligible for three years instead of two. And the benefit is that we don't have to requalify families every year. In addition, the Freedom Renovation Project is going to provide additional infant slots to our families. Another opportunity is the consol consolidation of the local migrant Head Start programs at Santa Cruz. County Office of Education will no longer operate its migrant season Head Start program effective March 2024. Two wonderful programs providing high quality services to the same community in one under PVUSD umbrella. They currently serve 145 children. So this is our current grant. We are funded to serve 640 children. 354 migrant, 286 seasonal. Basic funds is close to $10 million. Proposed grant details when, if, if expansion is approved tonight, to serve 785 children, 640 plus 145, 434 migrant, and 351 seasonal, uh, with an increase of almost $2 million to PVUSD. Questions? Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have one. Sean Henry. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I actually was a 
school psychologist in Ripon, so just right right there. We did more San Joaquin, but uh, a little bit there uh, with Salida, with some of the families. Um, so, uh, you know, the, it's always about money and, and, and what it costs and different things like that, but um, being the psychologist, I, uh, I, think I, have the, I think I have the district record of eight years with preschool um, to work with the Migrant Head Start, um, Seasonal Head Start um, program, um, the, the home-based, basically it's, you know, the children under three, they're under IFSP, so a family service plan. So um, it is really a second home uh, for these children uh, to work with, um, it, to say daycare is not even appropriate. Um, they, they give the love and the teaching and everything. And so um, I think as a psychologist and as an educator and as a researcher, I would uh, really be interested to see how many um, of the home-based programs were open during, um, during the COVID times, because um, there might have been a little bit less restriction on Migrant Seasonal Head Start. Um, and if we could uh, take that group and compare it to a control group that did not have it, I think you would find the efficacy to show the value of this program and that $1.9 million, again, <laughs> would be a fraction of the cost, but um, everything that they talked about, I'm just always um, impressed by Migrant Seasonal Head Start, and unfortunately our state is, um, is uh, like the nation is moving away from with things changing. Uh, supporting uh, migrant education, and it would be good to see something increase in Pajaro. I'm at Wattsville High School, and I remember we used to have like four or five migrant teachers, and uh, we're really happy uh, with the teacher we still have. <laughs> I think we have one, and the uh, and the international um, counselor. But uh, I, I highly recommend this. Thank you. Uh, any discussion from the board? Thank you. Um, thank you for coming all the way from Stanislaus. I think this might be the first time in 14 years I've seen somebody ha who has come from Stanislaus County of Education. Maybe you've come to take a look at our programs, but I don't think you've ever come in front of the board. So I want to appreciate you for doing that. We are very, very proud of this program. It is unbelievable. It's award-winning. You guys do such a great job, so thank you for all the work that you've done in the community. I know there are some, I've asked this in the past, and I know there were some um, family daycare homes that were ad administered by a different district, and, but they're in Wat the Watsonville area. And I was wondering, can, w can we, did we ever get those back under our umbrella, or are they still outside? So those are the family childcare homes that are con currently contracted with Santa Cruz County Office of Education. And they, they have been invited to contract with us now. Thank you. Trustee Scott? Thank you. Uh, just, a, just a basic question just for my uh, learning. Um, so it says uh, to serve 145 children transferring from Santa Cruz County Office of Education. How do, what does the transfer actually look like? Are they coming from one facility to another facility? How does that work? Typically, um, I guess there's two pieces to that. There's the contractual piece where we would uh, not renew the contract with Santa Cruz County Office of Education. And in the 24-25 program year with Pajaro Valley Unified School District, we would issue a new contract with all the new uh, figures that Angelica shared with you so that's I guess more on the administrative side on the programmatic side uh, Pato staff under Angelica would be reaching out to the family child care home providers that were not already contracted with Pajaro because I do know there were some that were shared um, but they would reach out to them to invite them to contract with Pajaro Valley Unified School District now that Santa Cruz County Office of Ed would no longer uh, be operating the program on a day-to-day -day basis and then just a reminder the funding cycle for this federal to local <laughs> grant is March through February so we submit everything by December 1st to Washington DC and that gives them 90 days to respond to us to our grant application 
Ms. Acosta. Yes. Hi, I'm Helica. Um, I, I, I will echo um, what Kim says. This is a wonderful program that you're the head of, and we're very appreciative and, and fortunate to have you and have you be the head of the program um, and all the good things that you and your people and your staff are doing in there. Um, so uh, we're at the 640, but I, I get adding the 145. And as that even aside, when just looking at the 640 number, the, my first thing that comes to my mind, and I, I did hear you say the words, that is what we're funded to serve. Again, federally funded. Is there, but I could see there has got to be so much more need than 640, even 785 students in Santa Cruz County. Right, and, and we straddle, this straddles because of the district geographically, do we, with your program, we straddle in to the our Monterey County side, the North Monterey County side where our district resides, right? right. Within those boundaries. That's a huge area. <laughs> so I just, I, I, I just imagine there's gotta be m much more than less than 800 children that could benefit from this program and need it. So w what can be done at, to look at that component of it. Every time there has been expansion opportunities for us to apply for additional funding um, from the federal office, we invite uh, every one of our contractors to submit an application alongside us to competitively go after those additional dollars and slots to serve local communities. So as those opportunities become available, we'll make that invitation again. The other piece that we do annually is we really assess each of our service areas. So we have programs in Contra Costa County, San Joaquin, Stanislaus, Merced, Madera, and then coming over towards the coast. Uh, Santa Clara is, our, is within our service region. We currently have no active programs in, those count, in that county. Uh, we also have Santa Cruz and Northern Monterey. So anytime there's shifting or if we're seeing some trends where we might need to move slots from one area to another. Again, we have that open dialogue and conversation with all the contractors to see uh, how we might be able to move slots around. And so we either apply for new funding or shift around existing funding. So we could try to increase how many of our youth that we're servicing. So currently our grant is for uh, 2,600 children. Okay. All right. across all those eight counties that I mentioned. Wow, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Is, is Trustee Soto still with us? No, he's not. Okay. Um, is, just to make sure I'm understanding correctly, and again, I just want to echo what my <coughs> colleagues have said. It's like, so I, I knew very little about this program when I first became a trustee you know, five years ago, and as I learned more, I just continue to become more and more impressed. Um, so thank you, first of all, for the work that you're doing. Um, and from what I'm understanding, what I heard, what I read, you know, in preparation for this, it sounds like there's no net increase in the funds that PBSD is using through this expansion, that it's all, is the, that? The 1.9 million that Angelica shared in the right. second to last slide, I believe that that's an increase in funding uh, right. that's but, coming no, to Pajaro, but. It's coming to Pajaro, but it's. From Santa Cruz. Right. So, but. Yes. but it's not. There's no additional expense. That's what. Right. No additional expense to the district. Not With the expansion of kids. Correct. Correct. Thank you. My yes. apologies. Yeah. I have a migraine, <laughs> so it is making speaking like challenging. Right. So, uh, we, yeah, we ensure that each of our contractors submits a balanced budget to us. Um, so yes. that's that's part of that process. Great. Yeah. Thank you. That's my question. All right. Can I just say one more yeah. thing? Is the 1.9 million, I know that will kind of come into the district to service this group of kids, but that also gets infused back into the community, right? Payment to the, the providers. And is this, is this an increase for the providers or is it exactly the same as what they were getting? There is an increase, great. So that's more money for our citizens in Pajaro Valley, wonderful. I, I was at a party one time, one day, and I found out that there were these slots here in Watsonville that were being administered in Santa Cruz, and I could not believe it. And I've been 
concerned and bugging people about how can we get them back. So this is really great news. Um, is this is an action item tonight? It is. I'd like to make a motion to approve. I'll second. All right. Um, and and <coughs> first and second, would, would you like to make a quick comment? Have your vote. Okay. So first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 403. And you wanted to make a yeah, comment? Yeah, real quickly, uh, compliments. The, there's a report that Ms. Renteria included, a community assessment. It's 54 pages. It's superb reading. Great history of ag, great history of the demographics and the changes in this community. And as the new guy coming back, it was really a delight to read. And then Ferris Sabah texted me right before this meeting and uh, indicated that the services are going to be better, meaning the county office is handing us the kids, and Dr. Sabah, who's from our community, knows the services will be better. Thank you so much, and thanks for making the trip down. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item 9.2, resolution acknowledging November uh, 6th through 10th is National School Psychology Week, and the report will be presented by Heather Gorman, our SELPA Director of Special Services. Good evening, President Holm, Interim Superintendent Sheckman, Board of Trustees, community members. I'm Heather Gorman, Special Services SELPA Director. So if you can take a look at the resolution Thank you. I'm not going to read through the full resolution, but please do take a minute to read through it. So during the week of November 6th through 10th, 2023, schools throughout the United States will be celebrating National School Psychology Week. The following resolution speaks to the work that the school psychologist does for PVUSD. I present this resolution this evening to highlight their work and dedication. This year's national theme is Let's Grow Together. This theme was inspired by the importance of both personnel, personal and shared strengths in our growth as individuals and school communities in every season of life. This is a time to recognize and show appreciation for school psychologists who support students' learning and mental and behavioral health, promote positive and inclusive school climates, serve on school safety and crisis teams and collaborate with families, teachers, and administrators to improve student outcomes. One way to draw attention to the importance of school psychologists, services, and children's mental health is to have a resolution commending the work of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District school psychologists. We strive to empower school psychologists by advancing practices, to improve learning, behavior, and mental health for all children and youth. So I request that you pass this resolution to recognize, celebrate the work of the school psychologists. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. One, Sean Henry. All right. Hello again. Uh, thank you very much for acknowledging um, our profession. Um, we are truly, um, first and foremost, your first responders of mental health. Uh, we have a lot of mental health support in our school district, uh, but in terms of um, district employees, um, you could basically say, uh, some people say we're the, the ninjas of, of the thing. Um, I, I, I say that we are a Swiss army knife um, that's underutilized. And um, I actually spoke with, uh, we had three interns last year, Unfortunately, not a single one stayed. Um, the two that I oversaw uh, are doing really well. Um, they described um, both working at one elementary school with about 500 or less students. Um, they do really less than the interns. They do 35, anticipating 35, initi 35 assessments and like less than 50. Um, because they are, they are looked at as, as mental health professionals but also um, not just special education, not gatekeepers. Um, we truly have all these different skills. Um, I've done a discussion about that before. Um, if you want to use one or two skills and, and staff us for that, then that's all we can do. Um, 
Uh, but you can talk to Morgan Hill Unified School District um, that is staffing at a higher rate and Monterey. Um, unfortunately, I don't have uh, my other colleagues here because uh, they're probably working on a report right now. Um, maybe maybe they're watching this. Woohoo! Um, but uh, it did my heart a wonder. Uh, one of the two interns um, was at a board meeting last night to advocate for raises. Um, so anyways, uh, I'm passing some things on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any discussion from the board? Well, I would just like to say, you know, um, yeah, Mr. Henry, I know you're 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 here, so in some ways you're kind of our proxy for you know all of our our, our well, school. My away. <laughs> but um, I want to thank you, you know, for taking the time to come to board meetings and taking the time to educate the board about the role of the school psychologist. And, you know, I, I really, and other school psychologists, you know, it's just the, but just the way the invitation, the, the advocacy is an invitation to people being their best selves. And, you know, I think about if we show that level to people that we disagree with or have frustrations with, then I can only imagine how that is for students that our, our school psychologists work with and what a gift that is. Um, and I know that our students benefit greatly from that. So thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to say thank you for bringing this forward. We appreciate our school psychologists very, very much in this district. They not only provide support to children and families and students, but also to our staff when we have when we have to deal with really hard stuff. So um, I know that a lot of your work um, is in testing and psychometric stuff, but there, there's so much more in your training is typically so much greater than that. So anyway, thank you, and I'd like to make a motion to approve this resolution. Can I second it and just make a few comments too? Sure. Thank you for this resolution. Thank you to all of our psychologists who have a really challenging job. We live in an area that has a lot of extreme poverty that's persisted for the years. And pr poverty creates trauma and all sorts of challenges that takes a toll on our parents, uh, the kids, and sometimes is expressed in negative ways at our school sites. And, and our teachers often have to deal with the school psychologists. And so my hat's off, thank you for serving our schools. Thank, and I think we should do whatever we can to keep our psychologists here. I know there's a lot of issues that are, that are being discussed about that and that we're gonna gotta keep discussing those issues and hearing about those. And uh, also knowing that everything's connected when we talk about mental health. When we talk about a uh, recent former administrator wrote an op-ed about making school fun, having arts and music, vocational opportunities, having some free creative time for our kids to express themselves. This is all connected. And so I, I just want us, everybody watching to think about that and understand that as we debate and deliberate a variety of topics at the school board. Thank you. All right, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 403. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on to item 9.3, recommendation of award of office, classroom and custodial supply contract to Palace Business Solutions. The report will be presented by Richard Ariano, our Director of Purchasing. All right. Uh, good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Interim Superintendent Sheckman. Um, thank you. Uh, here tonight to present the award of the contract for those supplies. Uh, Co-presenting with me tonight, I have uh, Gary Trowbridge, CEO and owner of Palace, and uh, Todd Trowbridge, Regional Vice President for Palace. I'm going to let them jump into their presentation that they prepared, and then we are happy to answer any questions about the process or the contract at the end. Thank you. Thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time tonight. I'll jump right in. Um, oops, what button do I put? Oh, here we go. Sorry. Okay. Palace has been in Santa Cruz since 1949. Um, three third generation brothers currently own the company, 
and uh, today we're one of the largest independent off-supply furniture and school dealers in the state of California. So tonight we're bringing before you the Pepham contract, um, and uh, this is uh, the best contract for California schools. I'm going to share with you just a few brief points. You have a lot more information um, in your packets there. Pepham is one of the largest nonprofit national purchasing cooperatives in the nation. They, the bid was executed out of Kern County Superintendent of Schools in the state of California. Only national contract that specifically focuses on schools. And it was a competitive bid, not an RFP, um, but it was an RFB, which is a request for bid. And there's 40,000 deeply discounted items on this bid. Here's some of the schools right now in the state of California who are currently using um, this, this bid. We cover Northern California, and there's another uh, large um, company in Southern California who does the other schools on this list. So why Pepham and why Palace? Um, Palace has exclusive rights to offer the Pepham contract in Northern California. You're dealing with a local company with local employees, local customer service, plus all of our deliveries are done on our trucks with our team. We serve over 30, 40 school districts on the Central Coast and Silicon Valley, and we have the best school-specific program in the country. And we have one of the few school catalogs that was based on what our local schools in this area need and want, um, and that's a picture of it on the right there. This is a just a performance level for last um, year with the school. Thank you for buying over $1.6 million from us. Now that's not just office supplies and school supplies, that also is Jansan, and it's two 1,100 teacher POs and a lot of furniture also that was all competitive. But the key thing here is your purchasing department saved with us 57%. You had a very aggressive contract in the marketplace. And I want to say again, your return rate was 1%. The average school uh, that we deal with is about 3 to 5%. And what I'm saying is you have a really good purchasing group that helps your schools buy the right items at the right price on contract all the time. This is the team that serves you. Todd is uh, the VP of sales and is your account manager. Joanne Mazay has been with us over 20 years and she is your customer care person. And then Tom Contreras works with your Jansen team to teach them uh, about compliance and how to use the Jansen supplies you buy from us. We always participate in the August annual school kickoff breakfast, giving away over 400 sample bags to teachers and guests. We provide free um, ergonomic chairs upon request by your safety and ergonomist. We also locate hard to, hard to find items for the district. And finally, we've partnered with you to pur um, with purchasing to facilitate the annual teacher PO program. This is our accounting department. We work very closely with you. Our job is to make it easy for them to pay us because we have a lot of um, invoices that go through on a daily basis. One of the things I'm proud of is we have a purchasing order tracking for all purchasers so you never go over your PO limits. There's never a problem with any of the schools. We input in two days 1,100 individual teacher POs to support you in giving your teacher, teachers the ability to buy um, every year separately. And we also make it easy to, to pay us. And this is our delivery team. Ryan's our warehouse manager and Xavier is our delivery driver. And uh, we do every site every day. Um, we also will do same day deliveries if needed uh, with no charge. We hold deliveries on vacations um, or holidays. Again, all deliveries are made by palace drivers on palace trucks. Nothing is outsourced. All deliveries are done just in time and all returns are picked up and credited next day. And that's it. Thank Questions? you. Do we have any public comments to this item? Yes, we do. We have one. Chris Webb. Um, I, I just want to say I think this is great that we work with Palace, and I, I really appreciate having this resource. Um, some some years, though, like I, for me in my class, I'd actually prefer to spend that two fifty or whatever it is on periodicals. I know part of the reason, like that, Dr. Rodriguez had said we were with Palace instead of like going to other places like Target or something was one, yeah, it's local, but then also you can't get things that, um, you know, Target sells alcohol and other stuff that, you know, you can't have, so that was part of why Palace. But the periodicals, you can't, you know, that's not going to get anybody under the influence. You can't eat it. I mean, you could eat paper, but that's not the intent. 
So I, it'd be nice to have a little flexibility um, to be able to use some resources for, for periodicals. And some of the cabinet, they know what periodicals I'm interested in. They are respected. But it's just an idea for the future. Thank you. Any discussion from the board? Uh, so I was happy to hear about that we still were um, administering, I think, the teacher PO. So is that $200 a, a semester, or right? Is it twice a year? So for, uh, so for this year, uh, the $250 was established for each uh, staff member right from the beginning of the year to be spent by, um, I think we're at March, and I'll just say end of March next year. So they were made available mid-September. We opened them September 21st, I think think which was a day ahead of when we opened them last year um, but yeah everybody has their own dedicated purchase order that they can spend with palace up until March for whatever supplies they need so they do could they, spend how do they implement that do they just show up and so um, here's every, my PO number or everything's online now so oh, um, I don't want to <laughs> there, there are no more uh, palace oh, brick-and-mortar stores downtown and 41st are no longer yeah but So yeah, everything is online and shipped directly to school sites, boxed and labeled for each individual staff member that orders. It doesn't. And come you guys are still a local company. Great, that's what I wanted to know. So in the past, have we done two hundred dollars? Um, each, it's like fall and spring, right? I it's thought uh, it was. It's taken a few different forms. I think the first year we implemented it, it was one twenty-five for the for the first year we implemented right. it, and then. Gosh, I think it was last school year we did 125, and then we added an additional 125 right. uh, for the winter. And this year we did the whole 250. So they can just spend with. it. That's great. Yep, and they yeah. can spend it all in one shot. They can spend it throughout the year. And it's can you really tell me how control. we publicize that to teachers? Like, do they actually know? Because I know <laughs> sometimes it's not that they don't use their allocation. I um I put it out as often as I can leading okay. up to it being released. Um, we're right at about the point where we're going to send a reminder. I actually did mention to Nelly. I saw it mentioned in our PDFT uh, kind of newsletter that gets posted. I saw that at Starlight Elementary that, um, you know, it's just a reminder that it is out there and available, but we do um, follow up. I, I mean, I, I respond to every message that I get when I send that out to all certificated staff to help them with either passwords or getting in touch with the Palace team to get their support to get their, their PO set up. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a project that I'm really proud of and I've, I've taken a lot of time to track it over the years. We're always trying to break the record for um, what we've done in a year. We've always been right around the 80% spend mark. So that leaves, a l I mean, that there's still a little bit more room to, to go up, right? I'd love to see it all get spent. Uh, so yeah, we in the purchasing department like to push that and make sure that that's being utilized. That's great, thank you. I, I just have a... Um Elaboration on what you said, Richard, in yeah. response to uh, t to Trustee DeSerpa's question of you. She said teachers, and when you responded in your comment, you said all staff. And when you say that word, that's a very encompassing sure. word to me. That's that's teachers, that's school psychologists, that's classified personnel. But to clarify, we're talking about just teachers, it's correct? It's a certificated staff. We have a list of exclusions that I don't, uh, I don't have it right in front of me. I don't want to misrepresent that right. um, but I'd be happy to get you that's right. always but, part but of the messaging that we send out for who is eligible I, right. it's, 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 like it's, it's certificated yeah. teachers but no I thought it was counselors too counselors yeah, are counselors and sites. Yes. Yeah. but not every district employee is what you, when you say all Correct. staff so, I'm yeah. just wanting to elaborate for clarification for a public um, yep. and does that also is that also encompassing our site admin or is Ad it just classroom Based. Administrators are an exclusion. Administrators are not included. Okay. Um, yeah, I could name a couple of other ones, but I'm not going to be able to no, name no, all of fine. the exclusions. But yeah, administrators but are not included. Perfect. Um, in the initiative. Y you elaborated on that for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just um, can I get a motion for? I'll make a motion to approve, and thank you for coming tonight. It's, it's late. I've got a I know. motion. And I, I just want to echo the thanks because it's. Um, we appreciate the local business. It's very important. Can I get a second? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 4-0-3. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rich.
All right. Um, item 9.4, approved notice of award for the Aptos Junior High School HVAC Modernization Project. Uh, 2023 report will be presented by Erlinda Fernandez, our Director of Maintenance Operations and Facilities. Good evening, President Holm, Inter Superintendent Shackman, Board of Trustees, Cabinet. My name is Erlindo Fernandez and I'm the Director of Maintenance and Operations. I'm here to ask for the approval for the Aptos Junior High Modernization HVAC project. This is an ESSER funded project. Back in July 28th and August 4th, the district advertised the Aptos Junior HVAC Modernization project. A mandatory bid walk was held on August 7th. Five contractors were present that day. On August 29th, the district received one sealed, sealed bid from Premier Builders Inc. This sealed bid came in at a million one hundred twenty-five one hundred seventy-one dollars. So I'm here to ask for the approval for to continue with the project for Optas Junior with Premier Builders for the amount of one million one hundred twenty-five dollars one one hundred seventy-one. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Scott? Uh, thank you. Just a question. Is this uh, going to be like a revamp of the air conditioning system at this school? Is that what's going on here? Correct. We're, we're uh, currently working in the gym area. So we're going to be upgrading rooms one, two, and three. They're getting a rooftop unit, okay. air conditioning, as well as heating. And the reason why I'm asking is because I know we're hearing from other schools that are having problems with AC. Is this, is this just a similar old systems that need to be revamped and or? or Correct. Yeah, this is this is running on an old boiler system right now, okay. since school was built there. So we're trying to, you know, we have some funding available at this site. So this is one of the projects we're moving forward with, to revamp this. I know we can't do everything at one time, no. so. This is where this is a good start. The rest of the campus has AC there, so we're. This is one of the areas that don't currently have AC, so that's what we're doing. Thank you, Trustee Deserpa. Did you have a comment? Sorry if you said this already, Orlando. This money is coming out of where? As they're funded, and Major L. We're using whatever they had left on their measure L and whatever was allocated on as a ESSER funded, ESSER, ESSER funded part of the money and then they're using the remaining of the measure L funds. Okay, I'd like to see that on the backup because it's not here okay. where it's coming from. It needs to say really clearly if it's measure L, which portion and which portion are it. Is ESSER or is it general fund? or? Okay. Would be helpful, and then we use we've used Premier Builders in the past, correct? Correct. They're, they're out of Gilroy. Gilroy. Yeah, they're out of Gilroy, California. Are they a union shop or? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first. Do I have a second? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries four zero three. Thank you. All right. Um, item 9.5, approve the addition of a special board study session on December 7th, 2023 to learn about and discuss possible impacts of declining enrollment. That's you, Mr. Sheckman. Thank you, President Holm. As this board has discussed, um, it has been my push to try and bring some expertise here from folks who've gone through the difficulties of a declining enrollment. It was tough to pick a date. December 7th is a date that seemed to work for most of our board. It would start at 6 o'clock, hopefully end at 9. They would like basically two hours worth of presentation time. They'll have administrators from school districts that have gone through declining enrollment. And I believe there's one CBO who was in a district that probably should have made some steps um, to deal with their declining enrollment and did not. And so that individual is going to share with us some of the pain after the fact. And in, there's no action that's taken at a study session. It's simply we 
learn, we discuss. Maybe you look at the superintendent or you look at cabinet uh, and have some recommendations for our follow-up. But it's really just a time to try and listen and uh, ask questions. And so I'm looking for your support to put that in motion. And that would be on December 7th from 6 to 9. All right. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do. We have one. Sean Henry. Ah, now I know. Now, you, well, yeah. <laughs> it actually was for the previous one. Um, uh, Mr. Sheckman, uh, uh, thank you. Um, that actually really, really helped and added to um, the knowledge there that um, we're getting a sampling of voices of how, how it's felt. Uh, hopefully somebody is from um, uh, Monterey Peninsula mm -hmm. since they're right next door and they know, they know the, uh, uh, it's almost like a flesh-eating bacteria once you go into declining enrollment. It's like there's no way to get out of it. Um, so um, since most of that's been addressed there, um, the WD-40 actually in the last bit was, um, it was kind of the, the working relationship of PVUSD with CSUMB or w with internship programs. Um, I kind of sometimes think of myself as the old cranky old psychologist now. Um, and so, you know, my, my uh, Swiss Army knife, that's a lot of those tools that have been closed for a long time, I have to really kind of grease uh, to get them open. And, um, and so I'm, it's a really a winning relationship um, for the district and for the professionals, because uh, you get a chance to really um, see, you know, who you're investing in and have them stay. So uh, this year we have, uh, I know we have one uh, intern, uh, Justin, uh, I think he coaches football at Aptos as well and is an Aptos High School graduate. So um, I'm thinking he wants to definitely stick around, uh, possibly maybe be a Marin or work there. Um, uh, so I just uh, thought I would use a little bit of that time to explain uh, the WD-40 and have a good evening. Thank you. Any discussion from the board? Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask my three colleagues who are here um, to maybe get just a little bit of reconsideration to the date. Um, I had reached out to Superintendent um, Shackman and had encouraged that we try to do this um, and requested because a few points. One, the sooner we do it, the better, um, number one. It gives us and access more time versus, because I think at one point we were actually starting to look at into the next calendar year. Um, so, but in December, we already have two regular board meetings on the 6th and the 13th. And if we add this on Thursday, December 7th, that will give us three more board meetings in within seven days. And the other option that um, Superintendent Sheckman had offered to the board was to do it on Thursday, November 9th. And in November, we only have one board meeting on Wednesday, November 8th. I think that's much more considerate of the board's calendar and schedule um, to consider the November 9th option. And um, also, that's before getting into the thick of a holiday season. I polled the board. More of the board were interested in the December date. Right, that's I'm understanding really that, I but I'm, there's to. four of us here. And so I've made the plea to my three colleagues who are here and stated my reasonings why. So I, if they're open to considering that. Then the only other thing, excuse me, that I'll add if you choose to do it on November 8th, we just need to call the company and make sure they're available on that day. And I don't. Well, and, and if they're not, no, if you, at the 9th, because the 8th is our regular board meeting, this would be the special meeting on the 9th. Correct. And if they're not available on the 9th, you would know well in advance for agenda setting committee. So on November 8th, we can make action to put it on the board's calendar for December. If that were to come up, that they're not available. Any other discussion from the board? Does that make sense? Can you repeat that one last sentence that you? <laughs> so, so I was following you up until a point. Sure. So you, you got the part about December three yeah. meetings seven yeah. within seven days. We yeah. only have one board meeting in November. This would put us two board meetings. 
also it would put it before the thick of the holiday season. I think it's more consideration of the board's calendar and board's schedule. What Superintendent Sheckman was saying is he will have to, he and his team will have to reach back out to this, um, I forget, I'm sorry, the name off the top of School, School Services, and see if they're available on the 9th because they probably already tried to slate them to December, but if they're not available on the 9th and the board approves to do this on the 9th, agenda setting committee will know in, the, in advance of setting the agenda for our November 8th meeting and we can then agendize it to the December 7th, which is really less than ideal for the board's calendar. Well, I, I just checked my schedule with my scheduler I'm free November 9th, however, we do have those meetings that are already pre-scheduled for the 7th, 8th, and 9th at Watsonville, Aptos, and PB. So right. if you wanted to ma make any of those. Um, well, and I think our focus was on those being community-based means. We're, there's going to be two of those on the 8th that we won't be able to attend because we already have a right. regular board meeting on the mm. 8th. But do we not have a board meeting on the 15th of November? No. Oh. I kind of wanted to attend the, the ninth at PV High. I'll be honest about that. Well, I, I preferred, I, to, I told you I preferred December, but, and I'm letting Trustee Acosta know that I kind of want to attend that meeting at PV High on November 9th. Mm -hmm. um, that last part on it? That, because we have that hearing yeah. the superintendent on the ninth, I would rather Which not. Which is for the community, that's not right. I mean, mm -hmm. we can, of course, attend any of those as board members, and we're still community members, yeah. but. Could we do it on November 15th? I think that's Clint, a uh, direction to ask Clint. I think these were the only dates they said they were available to you? Yeah, they. I think November 15th was the first date we really wanted to do, and we yes. actually asked them, and they were book solid. So they have two individuals who are really experts at this. One is on the finance side, one's on the HR side. The HR individual couldn't make it, and um, I've worked with her personally. Um, Daniel Connolly, she's amazing, and we'll probably provide a lot of good information. So we didn't want to basically get only one of them. We really wanted both. I will say that the second scheduled board meeting in December is, is our organizational meeting, and it's usually a fairly short one. Are you, re are you suggesting that we have it on the same night as our organizational? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. What okay. I'm just saying is, is that like if we had like three meetings, you know, in a seven-day period, it's not like we're having three full board meetings. It's we're ha it's we're, we're having one regular board meeting, a special study session, which we're anticipating about two hours, and then the organizational meeting, which is usually the a special hours. study session slotted for three hours. And, and just saying it is consideration. That's three meetings in seven days. I, I no, get your same I, I get time. It's still the time to be coming in for three yeah, meetings within you, you, seven you made that days. Point, yes. yeah. So I'm just asking for us to consider to doing it to the ninth and if it doesn't work out for the organization, um, then we would still have time to agendize it on the November 8th you need to have it on December 7th. You know, I'll just say too, I'm okay with pushing it out to after the new year. There's that too. I don't know if this is a super urgent thing. I mean, what do you think, Murray? <laughs> I think it's a very important event. I, I suggested a variety of dates, including in January. Uh, I presented you two dates. I took this to uh, this report based on what you folks, what you folks told me. So, look at your calendars. Let's make this work. M might I also offer if there's some thinking, some creative thinking. I mean, generally, Wednesdays are the way my life has been scheduled. I kind of know something's coming on with PBUSD that night. I don't know if Wednesday, November 29th is also possible. Just throwing that out. I know that's but maybe. Yeah, so th I, think, I think what, what Clint was saying is like in coming up, oh, the, the like they were available. Those two months. Yeah. Yeah, from my recollection, that was actually another date we offered was the 29th because we thought it would work well, but because of Thanksgiving and individuals at school services traveling for Thanksgiving and coming back and being on vacation, I think the two dates before January that worked for them were the two that Murray originally offered. Um, I don't know, 
off the top of my head, if now the November date works, they book up pretty quick, which is why they asked for kind of our quick response. So we did, they did hold the December 7th. Doesn't mean that the November is not available, but I don't believe there were any other dates really available other than doing like Mondays before board meetings is kind of the same problem we would run into. Um, so I think the two Thursdays we picked were pretty much what they had, again, unless you're looking at January when they had more time available. I, I just wanted to ask Clint to elaborate on that since Trustee the Serpa brought that up and I, I was one that went back um, and met with Superintendent Sheckman and said I think sooner is better. Do you recall what those January dates were off the top of your head by any chance or do you have it in your email or? I don't, I, I mean we can, Murray and I can definitely um, reach out. I mean one, one thing I can say in terms of the timing, um, obviously it is, it is extremely important. I don't believe, unless Jenny believes differently, it would severely impact her to have the information in January or the board to have it to start making decisions because really January through March she's going to be working on second interim and that's just really a retelling of this year's budget not really focusing on next year so any changes that would potentially be made having those kind of information from the board if there was any adjustments due to declining enrollment really having those in February March or around that time would be plenty of time I think from the finance side and that's only if you're talking literally next year making a change which I don't think you know we're going to have a presentation and then say let's blow everything up for next year and try and make drastic changes. So I think the timing wise, um, earlier is obviously better because the more time we have to plan, the better. Um, I don't know that if it really doesn't work for the board and the board all wants to be there rushing, it's always necessary. But again, as, as Murray kind of stated, we did want to make sure we got it done and it was going so that it didn't become this um, presentation that kind of kept getting delayed and then as Murray stated, we, we kind of heard some horror stories of yeah. we wish we would have known what we know now, you know, six months ago or a year ago. So you're, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I asked him now, so you're saying January would be viable for Jenny and the team uh, again, to, if, 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 if the, it were in January? If the board were to actually hear from the presentation and want to take action for the immediate next school year, depending on what those actions are, it's possible, it just, it, it all depends on what those actions would be. I don't think that one month time frame is going to completely set her back. Um, but again, I, I do agree with Murray that the sooner the better, just because we, we do want the information out there and want the public to have time to kind of understand what, what we're facing. So I, I, I wanted a chance to answer your question. Um, and that is, I, I don't have any strong preference you know, it's like the seventh works a little, a little better for me, but it's like I can make the ninth work. But it's, um, it's really what folks want to do. I'm also open to January. I mean, if that's a crowded time of year, right before the holidays. There's a lot of stuff happening. I could go either way, but I, if we don't have any meetings yet scheduled. We don't have our calendar for next year yet, do we? We don't have any meetings scheduled yet. In December, January. at the organizational, we'll That's do that. We do and that. Uh, typically in January, we only have one. Mm -hmm. So that might be a better consideration. Right, but typically the district is, I mean, just the district is on break and staff is not necessarily available. Yeah. We will follow your direction, board members. <laughs> So do you need a motion on this to table it or yeah. bring it back? Yes, we do. Okay, uh, I'll make a motion to, to table this to a later date, um, looking at dates in January for the special board meeting on declining enrollment. Okay. I, yeah, and I just, I, can, I just wanted to add some feedback on that. So I think typically to the point you made about staff I mean, our board meeting in January is around the end of January, around mm -hmm. the 24th, everybody's back. So if, the, if they're looking, because all the dates they seem to present were Thursday, so if they were looking at a Thursday, maybe Thursday, January 25th would be ideal. If, sure. if I just wanted to give that to Superintendent Sheckman. Of course. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 403.
Moving on to item 10.1, our PVOSD cybersecurity presentation, and that will be presented by Dan Weiser, our Director of Technology. Yes. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Sheckman. My name is Dan Weiser. I am the Director of Technology Services for the district, and October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, so the timing is perfect for this presentation. Um, I'm going to talk in some general terms about cybersecurity, and I want to just mention I'm going to go through the various things we're doing to make sure that all of our systems and data and um, accounts and you know critical systems and data are, are secure. Um, but I'm not going to go into a lot of specifics because this is being broadcast on the internet, and so there are some security aspects that we need to keep. Um, in order to keep secure, we're not going to broadcast some of the, the very specific systems that we're using. So, um, but I, I'm happy to answer some questions at the end. So, um, you know, educational institutions, as I know you're all aware, have been getting hit um, across the country, really, and, across, and all over the world uh, with cyber attacks. Um, I get, I have some statistics for you. Um, just, just last year in, in 2022, um, the, it, it, the Cyber hacks, attacks, incidents in education increased 44 percent, um, and they continue to increase. And, and education is one of the, the targets that they're constantly hitting for a variety of reasons, most, most of which have to do with funding. Um, you know, education institutions often keep their devices longer, and so sometimes they keep devices in production that no longer are receiving security updates and patches, right? Um, usually that's due to funding concerns and funding constraints. Um, also a lot of education institutions aren't necessarily on the cutting edge of security uh, technologies that are being deployed. And then in some cases, luckily for us, that's not our problem. Um, they don't have the, the technical staff with the technical expertise to make sure that the systems are secure. Um, so. We um, have Keenan, our, our uh, insurance partner, that uh, we actually have cybersecurity insurance through, through Keenan, and um, they have um, brought in an organization that, that they're working with, that's working with their customers to kind of go through a, a, a cybersecurity audit um, to review all of the different systems we have in place and review best practices. Um, so they're called Re Resolute Guard, and actually we just had our first meeting, and we have our next meeting scheduled. So it's, it's really good timing as well because as we started to work with Resolute Guard on reviewing the, the various um, best practices in cybersecurity, they, have, they use what's called the, the Hamilton Cybersecurity Best Practices. And so we went through all of those best practices and in that first meeting, it was great to see that we already had them all in place or we were already implementing them. And some of them are ongoing, they never end, right? Cybersecurity is one of those things. You're never done doing it. You're always continuing to do it. So because the, the vulnerabilities are always changing um, and then the cyber criminals are always coming up with new ways to attack organizations, we're constantly learning new ways to protect our data and to protect our systems. Um, so one of those, for example, like I mentioned, we're, we're constantly phasing out devices that are no longer secure just because they can't run a, a, a patched and secure system, which means we need funding to replace those end unit devices and then server infrastructure and databases as well. So we're constantly making sure that we're phasing out technology that isn't secure and installing technology that is modernly secure, cyber secure. So part of the process working with Resolute Guard um, will come, we'll eventually work with them to develop our own um, smart cyber action plan uh, and, and basically an incident response plan so that we'll have a detailed process prepared in the event, knock on for Micah, um, that somehow we ever actually have to deal with a cyber incident like that. So, um, so some of the critical components, uh, one of the main components that we review is kind of the network infrastructure and how we secure that infrastructure. Um, so the district, we're very fortunate that we've had a next generation firewall in place for many years. Um, so that's a system that protects everything on our network from cyber criminals you know, on the internet, but it, and it also protects um, in case a device were to get infected with malicious uh, a virus or some kind of malicious uh, uh, you know, software, it actually restricts that device from getting back out to the internet because oftentimes that's how it works, right? 
So if they infect a device, the device will then reach out to basically let in more, more malicious content. So it, it's, the firewall kind of works both ways. So it's protecting us from inside and from outside. Um, the nice thing about the system that we have in place is it's constantly getting updated information. So they call it a zero-day threat or a zero-day uh, vulnerability. So these things are happening all the time. And the second that this is identified, our, our firewall is updated with that information so that even if it's a brand new, new type of cyber attack, um, we're protected from that. So we also have one of the very highest rated um, endpoint protection systems. So we used to call that antivirus software. Um, now it, it does a lot more than just protect devices from viruses. It's, it protects from you know, all kinds of different malicious uh, cyber threats, um, including ransomware and phishing and all kinds of stuff. So those are, those are, um, that's implemented across all of our Windows and our Macintosh clients. And then, as you know, we are a big Chrome district, so we have Chrome devices for our staff, many staff members and students. And so we continually replace our Chromebooks because as they age, they eventually get to a point where they d they're no longer receiving those critical updates, so they're not getting security updates. So we need to get them off our network, make sure they're secure, so that we need to make sure that our students and staff have those up-to-date uh, devices. So the other part of that is we have two content filter block content filter systems, right? So this is what blocks inappropriate content on the internet. Um, for our staff, students, and, and really anyone on our network. Um, but it also blocks malicious content, right? They're constantly updating it to make sure that um, links that link to malicious content out on the internet are being blocked by our content filter and our firewall as well. So another critical component for our cybersecurity, or constant and ongoing cybersecurity um, efforts is really around securing our accounts, right? So passwords, making sure that we're using um, complex passwords, and that we're, we have a, a password policy that you know, requires changing the password periodically. And we've just begun to implement uh, multi-factor authentication. We've now done about three schools and uh, about three or four different departments. But we're rolling this out district-wide um, because it's actually a requirement um, of our cybersecurity uh, insurance company, but it's also really a best practice that's being implemented across organizations um, everywhere, really, and I know you've all probably experienced it with your own bank accounts and logging into various systems. There's different ways that you can do multi-factor authentication. It's not always a text message with a code. Um, the, the system that we're using actually is a lot easier in some, in, in some ways because it'll do push notifications. So it'll just pop up and say, are you trying to log in? And you just say yes. You don't have to read a code, then enter a code. Um, but it allows for that other layer of security. That way, even if somehow someone got a password from one of our staff members, um, they wouldn't be able to authenticate because they would be receiving that, that, that other layer of authentication, multi-factor authentication. So we're in the process of rolling that out. Um, we will have that you know, implemented across the, the district for all of our critical systems, and especially hosted systems, right, like online systems. Um, so our student information system has a lot of our critical data in it as well as um, you know, just logging into Google and other things like that. So, um, Also, we have one of the highest, most secure uh, data backup systems. It was actually something I brought to you, I think, last year. Um, so this is a, a, a system that backs up all of our servers, all of the critical data about our staff and students, and all of our systems that run our network and our phone systems and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so the event, in the event that we were ever hit with some kind of ransomware, or our servers got encrypted because of some kind of malicious attack, we have backups, and those backups are housed locally, and they're also housed in the cloud in case something terrible were to happen. We have the data actually um, backed up into the cloud as well. Um, and so those backups make it possible that in the event that we had some, some kind of you know, terrible malicious attack on some of our servers, we can and bring them back really quickly. Um, so that system, it's specifically designed for cybersecurity. Um, they, call the, they call it air-gapped, meaning that once those backups are, are stored, there's no way to get to them. So even if somehow uh, a hacker were to get onto our network or even access our backup servers, they wouldn't be able to access those stored backup files, um, which makes it you know, just this, the most secure possible for cybersecurity purposes. Um, and then our tech team is continually running um, you know, disaster recovery processes. We're testing those systems, making sure we can restore a server in case, you know, we, we go through different drills and processes and just sort of disaster recovery. And then vulnerability scans as well, just scanning our own systems and our own network to make sure that there isn't some, something that we're missing. So we're constantly looking and working to improve our cybersecurity posture 
Um, and then the last part of this is really just education, right, for staff and students. Last week was uh, Digital Citizenship Week for our students, so we did a whole bunch of work across the district with, um, you know, our teachers uh, teaching a whole bunch of, uh, did, you know, internet safety, digital citizenship, um, a whole bunch of lessons around um, ethical use of internet content, social media, and all that kind of stuff, um, along with cybersecurity and security events that we, we ha our staff run for schools. We do a whole bunch of parent events and work with the parent ed team to train our community and our parents and how to keep their kids safe online and how to keep their data secure. Um, and so we're constantly working on the education side. I often say this is a teaching hospital, so we, we have to make sure we continue to do that work. Um, and then um, we also are posting and, and always sharing content on our website and, and linking to good digital citizenship and cybersecurity information. We also have uh, the Keenan Safe Schools program, which um, all of our employees go through and take specific um, courses online, and cybersecurity is one of those they repeat every single year, and it reviews the various types of vulnerabilities and, and hacks and ways to protect yourself and to protect our systems from cyber concerns. All right, and, oh, 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 there we go, I was back one, and questions. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? Thanks, Dan. That was a great presentation. Um, so, you know, I went to the CSBA delegation assembly recently, and there are multiple school districts there that had been held ransom. Could that happen here? Could it happen? Is it possible? <laughs> um, I would like to say it can't happen here, but the truth is there is no completely 100% secure system. We used to say the only way to make sure it's 100% secure is to turn it completely off. Um, and so we are always doing everything we can. I think in a lot of ways, many medium to large size school districts across the country and especially in California have been hit. And I think that part of the reason we've never had a cybersecurity incident um, has been because we've been working really hard on this for a long time to make sure that we're implementing the highest level um, kind of enterprise level systems to give us the best possible security we can we can have and we're just very fortunate we've had a lot of great funding to make that possible through e-rate funding and measure l bond funding and cares act funding and emergency connectivity funding um, we've been able to really leverage those dollars and make sure that as we're implementing new systems that we're, we're including all the security necessary to secure them so So there's, you know, tons of phishing problems that happen across different types of businesses. Um, so if somebody accidentally clicks on something, like I know some of us have gotten um, email that are not, yeah, email that are not kosher. Right. Um, but if somebody here, because we have so many employees, clicks on that, what happens? So. Ideally, even if they were to click on it, and, and that's part of that educational side, we're, we're constantly reinforcing that not to click on links, not to click on uh, messages that you're receiving that you're not expecting, that kind of thing. But even if they click on it, our devices are, are behind, are, that we have content filters that block access to malicious content on the internet, e both on our network and even when those devices are off our network at, at, in families and in their homes and that kind of thing. So usually, even if someone were to click on one of those malicious links, it would be blocked. But it, there's always, once in a while, some, I mean, it happens to people all the time, and I hear about it often that, you know, people, even people you wouldn't expect, because sometimes they're real, they get really smart about it, right? And they, you think you're entering, you think you're on your bank's website, and you're entering your login and password and all that, and that's part of why that multi-factor authentication really helps with that. So as we implement multi-factor authentication, even when you click on it, when you get used to seeing that second level of authentication when you don't see it um, or the other side is really what they're trying to get is your credentials right so even if they get your credentials they can't log into your system because you, you have the multi-factor authentication that will block them unless they receive that code so we're implementing systems to reduce that the chance of that but the phishing scams will continue and we'll continue to do everything we can to block them and then educate people about being safe and you know protecting ourselves from that so and then my final question is um, in Measure L bond, we set aside money. I, what did we call that? 
fund, that special fund. It wasn't a trust. Oh, the endowment. The yeah. endowment, yeah. Yes. So we set aside a special technology endowment. Right. How are we, is that expended at this point? We still have a little bit of that left. Uh -huh. um, and that was to refresh right. we um, received our five, units and It, it was $500,000 a year, and that money specifically was for refreshing devices, and mm -hmm. we've used that money specifically to do that when necessary. And then also for innovation, right? So a lot of the, the fun kind of technology project and coding project stuff, we were using the endowment funds to get those projects in front of students and get the resources needed to implement those. Um, and then, um, you know, and then infrastructure as needed. So same kind of refreshing. If we had infrastructure that needed to be refreshed, we could use it for that as well. But we also had Measure L bond funds that were specific project funds that weren't part of the endowment. And so, some one of those examples is uh, one that was um, um, backup and storage. So, and, and it's basically server infrastructure, right? And so that's one that we've used to really increase our security and our cybersecurity systems as we've implemented um, new servers and new storage for our data. Um, and then there's other, other ones as well, other project funds that we used as well. And, and every time we implemented a new system, we would make sure that we were implementing everything that we could to make it as secure as possible, so. So since those funds are mostly expended, do we have the budgets here in our general fund to continue this work to protect? So we get, well, we, we continue to get E-rate funds, right? And that's, that's really infrastructure funds, but th that infrastructure fund at times can help us with it, you know, cybersecurity um, types of infrastructure. But it's really update, I mean, a, a lot of what the endowment has done for us has been making sure that our staff and students had up-to-date devices so we could get rid of a device that, that could no longer run a modern operating system that was receiving security patches and make sure that we were able to give that teacher another device that was up-to-date. Um, before, you know, so there has been in the past other funds, sometimes it was one-time funding, sometimes it was emergency connectivity funding, so we're always looking for other ways to fund that. Um, at this point, I don't know that there is a plan for an ongoing refresh fund. That's something we had in the, pa the past, but it would be something, some of it is written into the LCAP, so we do have some refresh funds in the LCAP, but, um, but as far as ongoing refreshing all of our cyber security infrastructure, it's not necessarily part of that, but I'm confident we'll continue to find the funds like we always do, and whether that's through you know, E-rate funding or, and actually they're expanding E-rate now to, to start to inc incorporate more security. So they just now started to include firewalls, for example, and aspects of the firewalls that were, weren't part of E-rate in the past. Um, so we're hoping to see that they expand E-rate to include more cybersecurity systems as well, and it looks like that's the direction they're going. So thank you. you, you answered my question about the ransomware, so I won't, won't repeat that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I know recently there was an incident where like my uh, email address was spoofed to solicit funds for a non-existent campaign. Right. Um, and you know, I, I know that you know, people like to use you know, their, their, their personal emails, uh, and I can totally respect people's decisions you know, for doing that, so it's not about individuals. I'm asking about you know, issues with the district. So whatever risk individuals want to take on for themselves, totally get that. Are there any risks to the <coughs> district? You know, or is it just the same as sending emails to? Well, everyone should have their own personal account that they use for their personal purposes, oh, course, yes. right? And then everyone should have a district account that we manage, monitor, and we implement security systems to secure. Mm -hmm. um, we pay the highest level of Google um, Workstation, it's Google Work Workstation Plus, and so with that really high level of, of cost, we get a whole bunch of Google ser services, including things that make our email more secure and ways to you know continue to protect that email, the, the email system. So yes, um, obviously, and, and that multi-factor authentication, there's a cost associated with that. So we're always implementing systems to secure our systems, just like our email addresses mm -hmm. and our email accounts. So yeah, so district, you know, so we always ha encourage people to use their personal email for personal business and then use the district email for all district-related business because we're implementing all sorts of systems to make sure that that's more secure. Um, and then that keeps us from getting something that might infect other systems or other devices and that kind of thing, so. All right. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Uh-oh. 
All right, so we will move on to our consent agenda. So those are routine items brought before the board. Do we have um, any public speakers to consent? We do not. Are there any items the board wishes to defer? Can I have a motion? I have a first, do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 403. Yeah. See, going on to our uh, report on closed session. Are there any items to report from closed session? Yes. Um, <clears throat> on closed session item number 2.1, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on October 25th, 2023 with seven and 15 additional action items. And I need a second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 403. On closed session item 2.2, .2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on October 25th, 2023, with 14 and seven additional action items. And I need a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 403. All right, well, that is it. And uh, any announcements? No. Okay. Um, and our next re meeting is regular board meeting on November 8th, and the meeting is adjourned at 921.